Good evening. I'm Dr. Andrew LaBarbera, Chief Scientific Officer of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to the 18th presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series. These webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Guide to Learning in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Tonight's presentation is by Dr. Tommaso Falcone. The title of his talk tonight is Reproductive Surgery, Surgical Management of Endometriosis and Fibroids. I will now turn things over to Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, who will review the details of tonight's presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. LaBarbera. Hello to everyone. I'm Jeffrey Hayes, the ASRM Education Specialist. Before beginning the webinar, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items with you. First, after the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your continuing education credits. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. Secondly, if you wish to ask a question to the speaker about the presentation, when you return to ASRM eLearn, click on the page link labeled Questions, and an email address will be provided. The question period will only be open for a three-week time frame after this presentation is posted. After the time period for questions has expired, the questions page will be a frequently asked questions page pertaining to this presentation and topic. Our speaker today is Dr. Tommaso Falcone. We're very excited for his talk, so I will now turn things over to our speaker. Thank you very much. <clears throat> First, I'd like to thank the ASRM for inviting me to give this presentation on a very important topic of reproductive surgery. Um, secondly, I'd like to highlight the fact that reproductive surgery is very broad. However, we're going to focus on surgical management of endometriosis and fibroids. Uh, reproductive surgery also includes a broader topics such as surgery for malarian anomalies, surgery for adhesions, um, and hysteroscopic surgery, etc. But because of the detail required for, um, uh, for a fertility or reproductive endocrinologist, uh, I think it's important for us to expand on these, to on these two particular topics of surgical management. Uh, as a disclosure, I have no financial relationship at all with industry. <clears throat> I do see, receive honoraria as editor-in-chief of uh, JMAG as well as section editor of UpToDate. First part, we're going to focus on surgical removal of endometriosis. And I've uh, subtitled it, When Is It Worth the Risk? Because it's very important to understand evidence-based medicine uh, as to where it's worth the risk of surgery uh, for an ideal outcome. So the learning objectives at the conclusion of this presentation, participants should be able to discuss the impact of surgery on fertility outcome, assess the pain outcome of medical or surgical treatment of endometriosis, although as I stated, it is going to, uh, we're going to focus on surgical treatment. And we're going to discuss the recurrence risk after medical or surgical management of women with chronic pelvic pain and endometriosis. So first, we're going to assess the uh, concept of burden of endometriosis, specifically the costs, as well as the quality of life, but I wanted to focus on the cost. If you uh, look at this publication from 2012 that was published in Human Reproduction, <clears throat> this was a study looking at the societal burden of endometriosis. There were two centers in the United States that participated. Uh, most of the centers, however, were in Europe. And that for this reason, uh, the quote of the uh, financial burden is in uh, euros. However, when we look at the societal burden of endometriosis in the United States, 49 billion euros per year is spent uh, on uh, women with uh, the burden of this disease. The productivity loss per woman uh, was actually double the healthcare loss. These women suffer immensely from chronic pain or, or uh, uh, infertility, and for this reason, there is a large societal burden. However, more germane to this presentation are the healthcare costs. Surgery represents 29% of this cost, as does uh, hospitalization at 18%. But surgery is an important contributor to the uh, cost of management of endometriosis. So let's move on to what determines outcome uh, with treatment of endometriosis. So treatment outcomes are dependent on several factors. Causality 
uh, is many times unclear. For example, in infertility, with a patient with early stage disease, and by stage I'm referring to the ASRM stage of endometriosis, going from stage 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, with early stage disease, it's unclear if the endometriosis uh, represents the main contributor to the infertility. <clears throat> Chronic pelvic pain uh, is the same concept. Associated syndromes such as painful bladder syndrome may be uh, contributing significantly to the uh, pain of the patient experiences, and therefore, even if we were to excise the disease, the patient may continue to have pain. Incomplete surgical management, such as when the endometriosis uh, is on a uh, organ which is sensitive, such as the ureter or the bladder. Um, the next concept of outcome is what do we define as excellent outcome? For example, <clears throat> if surgically we are able to remove the entire disease burden, and then the patient states that she has no relief or minimal relief of pain um, after the surgery, do we consider this a success? That is, success that we remove the disease, but unsuccessful in the sense that the patient did not um, have any relief of her symptoms. Treatment outcomes are significantly influenced as well by the different morphological phenotypes. There are three clinically distinct manifestations of endometriosis, pelvic pain, infertility, and ovarian cysts are the three major clinical phenotypes of this problem. And this patient may present with all three. The patient may have an ovarian cyst for infertility and pelvic pain, or um, uh, one of them. We also have to consider that the patient may have um, a pathological or uh, a visual phenotype at the time of laparoscopy, uh, which also may make uh, diagnosis more challenging. The definitive diagnosis of endometriosis is only made surgically at this moment as there are no biomarkers to um, obviate the use of uh, diagnostic laparoscopy. Histological confirmation is often required as visual identification of endometriosis is only confirmed in 54% of patients. The concept of um, uh, laparoscopy and visual identification is really uh, important because once a patient is labeled with endometriosis, the natural tendency is to attribute most of our symptoms to the endometriosis rather than trying to identify uh, an alternative cause for her symptoms. So this is an example of endometriosis. If you see here, there's a white lesion on the peritoneum of the pelvic sidewall, neovascularization. If you excise this, the pathologist will tell you this is, uh, represents endometrial glands and stroma characteristic of endometriosis. In this particular patient, these are papillary lesions which start under the left uh, pelvic sidewall, go into the cul-de-sac, and on top of the rectum. These papillary lesions, if they're excised, the pathologist will also um, return a diagnosis of endometrial glands and stroma. This is the classical presentation of pigmented endometriosis, the right pelvic sidewall. You excise these lesions, and the pathologist will say it was the same as the other lesions. As you see in this particular example, the ureter is found on the right pelvic sidewall, and these lesions occur very uh, frequently next to the ureter, and this is an important surgical concept. Furthermore, cul-de-sac disease, disease uh, in the uh, uh, area of the posterior vagina or retrocervical area, is also quite common. This is a close-up of that pigmented type of endometriosis, which again may be fibrotic, and deeply infiltrating, but under the microscope show a similar endometrial glands and stroma. This lesion is on the right uterosacral ligament, pigmented, red, hemorrhagic, and again, with this excision of this lesion, it's again endometrial glands and stroma, attributing to the fact that these phenotypic differences are due to a variety of host responses to the lesion, such as fibrosis, such as adhesion formation, and inflammation. This particular disease is characterized by a chronic inflammatory peritoneal response, which we think is contributing to the pathophysiology of the disease. We will define deeply infiltrating endometriosis 
as nodules extending more than 5 millimeter beneath the peritoneum. On this example, you see that there's extensive endometriosis of the retrocervical area uh, and, and the uterosacral ligaments, the vagina, the bowel, the bladder, the ureters. So deep endometriosis of these areas is considered to be deeply infiltrating endometriosis. This is a magnetic residue uh, imaging of a sagittal view. This is the uterus. This is the endocervix. This is the rectum, <clears throat> as you see over here. And the rectovaginal septum, which goes from the level of the, uh, of the rectum all the way down, um, as you see in this whitish area, broad white area, going all the way up, is uh, free of disease. Just remember, this is the cervix. The vagina is very thin on this side. But the whitish broad area going up towards what appears to be an infiltrating lesion between the rectum and the back of the cervix is typical of endometriosis. Most endometriosis in the cul-de-sac is, in fact, rectocervical and not rectovaginal. Although it can occur down the rectovaginal area, the most common um, area of the cul-de-sac, in fact, is retrocervical. So that when you uh, will do surgery to remove this disease, you will find normal rectum, uh, normal, uh, normal rectal fat beneath the actual lesion. This is, again, another view of the, of the fat of the rectum um, going towards this lesion. The rectovaginal septum is uh, maintained. However, this lesion in back of the cervix is what makes the um, rectum firmly adherent to the back of the cervix. How, but because there are tissue planes, normal tissue planes below, this lesion can be excised. The next question before we move on to the uh, outcomes of surgical management is what is the natural course of disease between the, uh, of, of patients with endometriosis? Well, this is a, a summary of, of studies that were done where the, um, where the patient had a first laparoscopy and then subsequently a second look laparoscopy. And in this particular case, these patients were not treated. Often they were part of randomized clinical trials, such as the Sutton trial and the Abbott trial, where half the patients were randomized to, to non-intervention and a second look laparoscopy performed to evaluate um, the, um, the disease. Um, and at that time, as you see in patients in Sutton's trial, as well as Abbott's trial, there are patients with regression of disease. Most of the patients are stable, but a significant uh, group of patients have progression of disease, as you see in, this, in these examples. So 29% progress, 29% are stable, and 42% can, um, can, can regress. Now, this regression is, um, is weighted to some extent in one particular study. Uh, if you look at the Sutton trial, um, of the 24, uh, approximately a third regressed. And if you look at the Abbott trial, um, uh, less than a third regressed. Uh, so again, it's unclear what the percentage is. But what is clear is there are a subset of patients where there is regression. And it's usually mild or early stage disease. We're going to treat now um, these groups, infertility and pain, separately. However, it is very important to understand that, in fact, this occurs, these two uh, phenotypes occur in the same patient, and therefore we must um, be able to uh, um, proceed with the management of both. So medical suppressive therapy can, can um, um, help uh, excuse me, uh, medical suppressive therapy, in fact, does not help uh, patients with infertility. It can help patients with pain, but it does not help patients with um, uh, infertility. Medical suppressive therapy, such as agonists, oral contraceptive progestins, have no role in the management of infertility patients. The for patient's fertility before um, going on suppressive therapy is the same after she has... Um, uh, uh, been on medical suppressive therapy. So therefore, it is not recommended that these patients have any type of uh, suppressive therapy postoperatively. There is some controversy with this, but this is the general accepted dogma of, um, uh, of the role of medical suppressive therapy. Uh, however, patients will respond properly to a typical medication that we use for treatment of, of uh, infertility. 
Now, surgery for minimal or mild disease or stage 1 and stage 2 disease by the uh, American Society for Reproductive Medicine um, standard uh, does show that there may be value to, to the treatment of minimal or mild disease. It's very important to note that this, these two studies, one a Canadian study and the other one an Italian study, um, both treated um, patients that had to have pigmented endometriosis. The number needed to treat was 12 with very wide confidence intervals if we collapse these two studies. Now, the number needed to treat of 12 does not imply that you're doing 12 laparoscopies because there's the prevalence of disease uh, is what's going to determine the ultimate number needed to treat based on laparoscopies. So you'd have to do 40 diagnostic laparoscopies if the prevalence is 30% to get an extra pregnancy. For this reason, generally, we do not recommend um, surgery for minimal or mild disease in women uh, that, are undergoing, uh, that are undergoing infertility assessment unless we can increase the prevalence of disease, um, um, increase the prevalence of what we will find at time of laparoscopy such as patients that have uh, dysmenorrhea uh, or dyspareunia, in which case they would benefit also from the uh, pain relief from doing the surgery. Now, the most controversial of the areas for reproductive uh, in, uh, endocrinologists is the management of endometriomas. This picture shows two endometriomas with the so-called kissing ovaries because of the size of them and they are attached to each other by adhesions. The management of these endometriomas are challenging, but very critical uh, to the reproductive endocrinologist. Um, although, as you will see, people can always choose the option of non-treatment, most of these patients, in fact, have to be treated for a variety of reasons that we will go into. So why do we remove endometriomas? Well, first of all, the majority have some type of symptom, dysmenorrhea, chronic pelvic pain, dyspareunia. So, and these patients that present, they may present with infertility, but you're obliged to treat them because of the fact that they have symptoms. We also would remove um, these uh, endometriomas because of the association uh, with possible malignancy. So, for example, in these three, uh, in these two separate publications, in Lancet Oncology Human Reproduction, it clearly shows an increase uh, in, uh, in, a, in, in the prevalence of this, specifically clear cell uh, cancers, odds ratio of three, low-grade serous endometrioid invasive cancers. In the human reproduction um, publication, which came from the Dutch uh, nationwide database, subfertile women with endometriosis, in other words, it's just not endometriosis, but endometriosis in women that are subfertile, which in itself could be a confounding variable, uh, show the higher Z ratio of uh, up to 12, which is uh, clearly not background type of noise that you would get um, from uh, chance associations. So, why do we, we uh, proceed? We proceed to exclude malignancy even though the risk is small. Now, ultrasound can sometimes steer us in the correct direction, but sometimes it's difficult. For example, in this particular area, this could be uh, on the right, for example, this is a classical presentation of the uh, snowstorm pattern of endometriomas. On the left, this could be a clot within the endometrioma, also, or it could be a solid component. When you repeat the ultrasound, if you still find it, uh, what appears to be a clot or a solid component, they may confuse the picture. And therefore, exclusion of malignancy, especially with large endometriomas, such as over four centimeters, I think is, um, is, would be accepted as the, appro the clinical approach. We would, even if you're a pure uh, IVF doctor, uh, it is often difficult to um, navigate around the endometrioma if it's particularly big in order to uh, uh, extract oocytes. Uh, there's a potential for puncture and infection uh, and contamination of the oocytes. So therefore, again, may be obliged to remove the endometriomas. So once you've decided that you um, need to need, remove the endometrioma, uh, the question is, uh, are we going to impact uh, the patient's ovarian reserve? There are three questions that we should pose ourselves, to ourselves. Does the intrinsic presence of an endometrioma decrease ovarian reserve? Does the fact that we remove the endometrioma decrease the ovarian reserve? And finally, does the presence of the endometrioma at the time of IVF 
if we decide to leave it, does it impact outcome? Well, we do know from a couple of studies that were published um, five, six years ago by Benalia and Almam that if you look at small endometriomas, small endometriomas, so the first study of Benalia is the mean size is 21 millimeters and all of them were less than four centimeters because the trend was to remove um, larger endometriomas. There was no difference in ovarian response, so the um, <clears throat> ovarian reserve was judged by the ovarian response to stimulation patients with undergoing the first IVF cycle. If again, Almang with again an amine diameter of 2.8 centimeters, there's no difference in the number of oocytes retrieved compared with the contralateral ovary or contralateral group without endometriosis. Testing that perhaps there is no intrinsic impact of the mere presence of an endometrioma, at least a small endometrioma, on ovarian reserve. Now, when you have bilateral endometriomas untreated, uh, this is, uh, again, by Benalia. If you look at unoperated bilateral endometriomas versus the control, which had no cysts, the serum AMH pre-IVF seemed to be the same, not statistically significant. The mean diameter, however, of these endometriomas are, again, very small. Total number of oocytes received, retrieved were not significantly different, nor were implantation rates or pregnancy rates. Nonetheless, this is some preliminary data from our own institution. If we look at endometriomas of more than five centimeters, or a mean size in our group of five centimeters, we found that there was a trend, although not completely significant, to have uh, decreased antimalarian hormone levels in patients with endometriomas as compared to patients with endometriosis but no endometrioma and patients without any endometriosis at all. Now, if we look at follicular density where uh, these endometriosis, uh, endometriomas occur, if we do cortical biopsies, what we find is the follicle density is lower in the cortex from ovaries with endometriosis than those with unaffected contralateral ovary. Again, attesting to the fact that perhaps there is a decrease in, um, uh, in, anti uh, in ovarian reserve as reflected by antimalarian hormone or cortical biopsies intrinsic to the mere presence of the endometrioma. If we look at oocyte quality and the unoperated ovarian endometrioma, the fertilization rate and the affected and intact gonads was the same. Cleavage rate and the high uh, quality embryos were not statistically different, although there seemed to be some numerical difference. Remember, the affected one was 31%. What about spontaneous pregnancies after endometrioma removal? So if you do decide, I'm going to remove the endometrioma, um, is it worth the outcome? Remember, I said if you have peritoneal disease, which is early stage endometriosis, there doesn't seem to be a dramatic effect. But if we look at it from the endometrioma point of view, uh, there may be. So if you look at, uh, first of all, if you simply decide you're going to excise the cyst, versus ablating. And in this two randomized clinical trials, ablative therapy was performed with bipolar uh, electrosurgery. So if you look at excision, it's associated with reduced rate of recurrence, reduced symptom recurrence, and increased spontaneous. It's important to read spontaneous. And for this reason, the ASHRAE guideline uh, states the clinicians can consider performing cystectomy rather than carbon dioxide laser vaporization women ovarian endometrioma because of the low recurrence rate of the endometrioma. Virgilini looked at 14 separate studies, approximately 1,500 patients, with an overall weighted mean of 50%. Now, just remember that because we are able to predict at laparoscopy that the patient will have an endometrioma, the correlation between the number of laparoscopies and the actual removal of endometriomas is almost one-to-one -one as compared to peritoneal disease where we may be incorrect uh, in, in the majority of cases. So the number needed to treat for removing an endometrioma was four. Now, surgically, when we remove an endometrioma, as you see over here, we make an incision and there's a fibrotic interface between the ovary and the actual capsule of the endometrioma. This fibrotic interface makes the surgery challenging. 
So this is an example. The patient has a large left endometrioma, relatively normal pelvis, and we're going to make an incision. And as you see here, as we pull the endometrioma off, there's a fibrotic interface between the actual ovary and the endometrioma. So how do we uh, uh, proceed? We usually there are adhesions around the ovary, as you see over here, so we lyse the adhesions. It is important to look at the other ovary to make sure that uh, the other ovary is not uh, severely compromised and therefore um, dictates a more uh, conservative approach. The next step, after lysing the adhesions, we would uh, recommend injecting vasopressin. Um, and vasopressin is an off-label use of this medication. It is not approved by the FDA for injection into, the, um, into an endometrioma. However, several randomized clinical trials showed that there is decreased blood loss um, if you inject endometrioma, uh, w the uh, capsule of the endometrioma with dilute vasopressin. So if you look at this, you will see that um, um, you will have uh, decreased blood loss and therefore we recommend injecting between the ovarian cortex and the capsule of the endometrioma. Once you've injected this, you can proceed to excision with a relatively bloodless field. Now when you are removing the endometrioma, um, there is a risk of decreasing ovarian reserve as you pull on this endometrioma. Now, MUTSI showed um, with the stripping technique that in fact you do remove ovarian tissue with the cyst. Now the endometriosis itself, the endometrial glands and stromary, within the inner cyst rarely penetrates more than 1.5 millimeter into the cyst capsule. He also showed whether you, you make a circular incision or whether you're just pulling, you will remove the same amount of tissue. So what is the impact of excision on ovarian reserve? Well, according to this meta-analysis published in JCEM in 2012, there's an up to a 30% fall in antibalarian hormone and unilateral cystectomy and an even greater fall in bilateral cystectomy. What is interesting is in, Mut in Mutsi's trial, the meta-analysis, there's no change after no ex non-excisional surgery. So if you have um, um, non-excisional surgery, for example, using laser, etc., there in fact is no change in anti um, uh, in, in um, antral follicle count, which is just a sign of um, <clears throat> ovarian reserve. Now, what is interesting about this, of course, is that I told you beforehand there's an increase in um, recurrence if you just ablate. This is true, uh, and therefore, one you have to weigh um, the probability of decreased ovarian reserve versus uh, complete surgery and recurrence. If you look at bilateral endometriomas, this published publication in 2008, there was no doubt that the uh, day 3 FSH, <clears throat> as well as other markers of uh, ovarian reserve, such as follicle, number of follicles, oocytes, etc., as well as pregnancy rates, were far decreased after excision of these endometriomas. Um, Exocudos uh, published in 2004, there was a reduction in ovarian volume. Uh, and another publication in 2011 also showed decreased ovarian volumes and angiomalarian hormone. What was interesting about this particular study, that even highly experienced surgeons uh, did show that there was a decrease in ovarian reserve. Right, so if we're removing um, these cysts, what about the alternative? Say, so, well, let's just leave them in. Uh, will that have an impact on our IVF outcome? In fact, five studies showed that no treatment versus surgery before IVF, there was no difference in clinical pregnancy rate at all. Uh, there was no significant, significant difference in any of the outcomes. In the Cochrane database, the same thing. It doesn't appear that the uh, treatment of endo small endometriomas, anyway, less than five centimeters, has any negative effect on IVF outcome. Furthermore, uh, aspiration itself did not yield any improved clinical pregnancy rate. So, the actual consensus in infertile women with endometrioma less than three centimeters, three centimeters or less, there's no evidence that cystectomy prior to treatment uh, with a cystic uh, reproductive technology improves pregnancy rates. 
and women with greater than three centimeters, so uh, four centimeters approximately, uh, good clinical practice, which is what these words stands for, recommends clinicians only consider cystectomy prior to ART to improve endometriosis-associated pain or accessibility to follicles. If you can, she has no pain, and, and you can get to the follicles easily, there's no reason to even remove larger ones. But in my experience, in fact, the larger ones make it difficult for us to um, access the uh, follicles for um, egg retrieval. Furthermore, it is recommended that we counsel women with endometriomas regarding the risk of reduced ovarian function after surgery and possible loss of the ovary. The decision to proceed should be considered carefully. So, what can we do to minimize damage? Well, rather than using energy, electrosurgery, we can use a hemostatic agent, for example, over here, by applying something like Flosio. There is a study um, done uh, where the patient had a three-stage procedure, the endometrium was drained, it was placed on an agonist, and then they went in and did laser vaporization. It is important to note that although the, um, de there was a minimal decrease in ovarian reserve, there was a very high recurrence rate. Jacques Donnet, same thing, looked at uh, cystectomy uh, for most of the cysts and then laser vaporization in the hilar area, or the use, as you see in this picture, of plasma energy for very small endometriomas where you're only uh, ablating the uh, glands, which are, uh, uh, as I stated before, uh, less than a few millimeters. What else can we do to, Im to minimize um, uh, damage? Well, the impact on ovarian reserve, for example, if you look at this bipolar uh, electrosurgery versus suturing, um, the, in this, in this meta-analysis, 21 studies, bipolar uh, energy did more harm to ovarian reserve than sutures. And then in this systematic review in uh, JMEG, all three randomized clinical trials show that the desiccation group had greater loss of antibiotic hormone than using a hemostatic agent. So, for example, if you are going to use bipolar cautery, you should use it minimally for hemostasis, as you see here. Partial cystectomy and ablation of the hilum was recommended by uh, some. However, in this recent publication in 2016, a uh, randomized trial between stripping versus the combined excision ablation, there was no, uh, with, but no post-op suppression. Uh, recurrence rate at six months uh, was higher, uh, but not significant. Um, and therefore, you, um, if you look at post-op pain recurrence, however, it was 17%. In the, uh, in the group where you ablated. But the antral follicle count and antral hormone, antral follicle count was the same, antral hormone was not measured. So what you can see from here is that this combined approach of excising part and then ablating part of it didn't seem to make a material difference. So how do you decide? You, I've, I've presented evidence that if you um, if you remove the cyst, you have higher spontaneous pregnancy, decreased recurrence, and better relief of pain. But if you do so, you may compromise the ovarian reserve of the patient. So the way, my, in my personal experience, that I would approach these patients is you look at the pelvis. If this patient on the left has a pretty much normal pelvis except for this large endometrioma, this one I would excise the cyst completely. If, however, you have a situation, as you see on the right, <clears throat> extensive adhesions, with difficulty visualizing the adenexa. Um, in this patient, even if you lysed all these adhesions, the recurrence rate is very high, the rate of spontaneous pregnancy is very low, and therefore this patient will move on to IVF, and therefore it is best to be conservative with these patients. How can we prevent recurrence of cysts? Well, if the patient is not interested in immediate fertility, suppressive therapy has been clearly shown to decrease recurrence different types of suppressive therapy, but um, the typical birth control pill is, um, is adequate. So now we're gonna move on to pain management, surgical management of patients with pain. Well, I'm not going to go into medical therapy, but they definitely are effective, and there are three which are FDA approved, generic agonist, oral progestins, and injectable progestin. Now, there are two randomized trials, prospective placebo-controlled trials, and um, showing and uh, testing two observations. 
one, that there is a significant placebo effect in the short term. So a 30% response rate of six months is typical of a placebo effect, uh, even with drug therapy. However, um, there is an 80% response uh, to six months to a year with the number needed to treat of 2.1, so clearly very effective. The main problem with uh, surgical management of endometriosis in patients with chronic pelvic pain is not the immediate relief, but the recurrence. So if you follow the patient for a year, Sutton's trial, they showed a 10% recurrence. In Abbott's trial, at three years, they showed a 36% probability of further surgery. Now, the, the, there is, other than when to remove endometriomas, the next controversy is the excise versus ablate. First of all, whether you do one or the other, the pregnancy rates seem to be the same. However, when we look at pain relief, there are two randomized trials. The right trial in 2005, early stage disease. Her Healy trial in 2010, one year follow-up. There seemed to be equivalence uh, for early stage disease, whether you ablate or excise. But it was observed post hoc that deeply infiltrating endometriosis occurred more frequently in the excision group versus the ablation group. Furthermore, Healy and his follow-up, five-year follow-up, showed that excision, in fact, was better for pain outcomes for dyspareunia. The concerns are these. If you look at this patient on the left ovary, you have extensive endometriosis here. If you were to use coagulation or electrosurgery uh, or laser, in this area, there are two possibilities. Um, because of the extensive nature, you would um, either damage the underlying structure, which would include the ureter, or you would leave residual disease. This is the right side of the patient under the ovary, extensive deeply infiltrating endometriosis. If you were to simply ablate this area, you would have, again, a, very, a lot of difficulties unless you ablate very deeply uh, and could uh, injure the ureter, or uh, you would leave a disease behind. Same thing occurring on this on the right side. You see the ureter. You see extensive endometriosis. Again, if you ablate here, you will, you will burn the ureter if you were going after deeply infiltrating disease. So it seems logical that excision is the only approach to these patients. So this is what, what my recommendations are. This is a patient where I removed entirely the disease of the left pelvic sidewall. This is the ureter. This is the uterine artery. The uterine artery is coursing over the ureter. This is the obliterated umbilical, and this is the obturator nerve. And you see extensive resection of endometriosis in order to provide patients with relief. Nonetheless, if you look at the study where we followed the patients up to seven years, mere excision of endometriosis, which is the lower curve, at one year we had a 10% recurrence, and at three years a 30% recurrence, similar to the uh, Sutton and uh, Abbott trials. But by five years, we had 50% recurrence in spite of the fact that we had extensive resection of endometriosis. This was published in 2008. The only limitation of the study is that at that time in 2008, meaning that we had started the, the observation period in, 19, in, in, uh, uh, in the year 19, uh, 2000 approximately, um, we were not routinely putting patients on suppressive medical therapy, and therefore this may this curve may look different nowadays. These two curves represent the outcome of hysterectomy. The yellow being hysterectomy, the ophorectomy, and the blue with conservation of the ovaries. You see these two curves are very similar. Our observations, especially in women between 30 and 39, is that at seven years, the reoperation free interval, in other words, 11% of patients with hysterectomy with ovarian preservation where hysterectomies were, where uh, ovaries were removed, were very similar. And therefore, it is recommended that the ovaries that are normal be left in if you are contemplating hysterectomy in these patients, as it does not seem to make Dr. Falcone, we can't hear you.
Dr. Falcon, we've lost your audio. Is he still logged on? Yeah, he's still logged on. Helps me out later when I'm doing things. Can you text him? Yeah. Um, we're still seeing the slide. Dr. Falcone. Yeah, hi. Hi, yes. We we've lost your. We can see your screen. We just can't hear you. Well, but I'm not doing anything differently. You won't uh, put a package here. Um, I'm trying to check. Um, oh, there you are. Okay. I'm, uh, do you hear me again? No, I I can't hear you. But I I saw you move your slide. I'm seeing everything you're doing on the screen. Yeah, because it's just. Your network connection has been reestablished. Can, so that's why I'm saying, can you, okay. is it possible? Okay, if you would, you need to dial in again that, for your okay. telephone. For the telephone. There, there we are. go. We have you back. Okay, good. Okay. Very good. Okay, good. Okay. I wonder, so, Tomas, maybe gonna... you should go back one slide. Yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah. Okay, I'll go back to here. Okay, yeah. and just pick up when, whenever you're ready. And we can edit okay. this, so don't yeah. worry. Okay, excellent. Added all the Italian accent. Okay, good. <laughs> all right. So in this slide, we show that uh, in patients uh, that are undergoing a hysterectomy, that in fact it is recommended to um, conserve the ovaries. If we look at uh, two years, five years, and seven years reoperation-free probability in women that have hysterectomy with ovaries preserved, 89% did not require further intervention. If you had ovaries removed, 85% required no other intervention. So similar outcomes. Caveat here, of course, is that um, all visible endometriosis is excised at the time of hysterectomy. The next concept that we need to explore is the concept of postoperative suppressive therapy. We need to distinguish what is considered to be short-term therapy, arbitrarily defined as less than six months, and long-term ter therapy. The long-term therapy is aimed at secondary prevention, meaning that we were, we're trying to um, re prevent recurrence of disease. What has been shown is that if you give a short interval of post-op suppressive therapy, let's say six months from the time of surgery, and then you remove the suppressive therapy, one year later, whether you give her suppressive therapy or not, the outcome is the same. So it is not recommended. However, in women where we give long-term suppressive therapy, defined as more than six months, or for example, at least 18 to 24 months, then we know that post-op suppressive therapy will prevent recurrence of symptoms. So if a patient has surgery, and you, you, the recommendation is to put her on long-term suppressive therapy until um, she is uh, ready for, uh, for fertility, to have a, a child, or until she's in menopause. Suppressive therapy then is very important in preventing recurrence of disease, but it does, no, does not have value as a short-term uh, post-operative suppressive therapy solely to improve the outcome of the surgery. It will not improve the outcome of the surgery unless it's given long-term. Now, there are different types of uh, uh, ancillary procedures that we can perform. And this example, for example, uh, is a uh, presacral nerve uh, to perform a presacral nerectomy. Now, to be clear, if you wish this to succeed, you need to start the bifurcation of the aorta. The bifurcation of the aorta, if you look at this, um, you would, in fact, call it a pre-lumbar nerectomy. And therefore, if you want to, be, uh, to use this technique for mostly central pain, you need to start at the bifurcation of the aorta to perform a pre-lumbar nerectomy. If you started very low in the presacral area, 
by that time, the pluxes have, have divided uh, immensely and therefore as of uh, decreased value. Furthermore, if you're the Luna, what used to be called the Luna procedure, which is laparoscopic uterosacral nerve ablation, has been shown in multiple trials to be useless in a long-term outcome. The role of robotic surgery is obviously continuing, and this is perhaps uh, somewhat of an uh, irony, uh, uh, but um, the concept here is this person is offering this patient two options, either an evidence-based treatment or an exciting, very risky alternative. Uh, clearly, we need to offer evidence-based treatment. So it's, so far, there seems to be no eminent value for uh, robotics in minimally invasive uh, surgery for endometriosis. However, there are some trials, such as those uh, uh, using it for treatment of ureteral endometriosis or bowel endometriosis, that may in fact have some benefit. Although these are small trials, at least uh, we, we can uh, ascertain that it may have some effect. Now let's go to deeply infiltrating endometriosis and the pain outcomes. So. If we look at patients with uh, pain and um, deeply infiltrating endometriosis, we're talking about three areas, the bladder and ureter, the bowel, or the rectocervical area. Sometimes it is rectovagal, and mostly it's rectocervical. What has been observed is clinicians can perform surgical removal of deep endometriosis as it reduces pain and improves quality of life. Now, for moderate or severe disease, there is, in fact, no randomized clinical trial um, looking at for benefit for infertility. And surgery then is not recommended for fertility alone for advanced endometriosis. If the patient typically has pain, you should do it, uh, surgery for that. However, if the patient is purely infertility with advanced disease, uh, then the recommendation, in fact, is to go to assisted reproductive technology such as IVF. Now, IVF with untreated colorectal endometriosis has some a controversy in the literature. So if you look at these two studies, IVF outcome, the same whether you did untreated colorectal endometriosis or the controls. In this other study, um, untreated colorectal endometriosis and fertility, cumulative pregnancy rates are very good. In fact, they only showed a negative impact of other parameters. However, the um, Bianchi showed, in fact, improved outcomes with IVF after removal of a deeply endometri uh, infiltrating endometriosis as this other study. So they're really this, the, um, the, the, it's not clear from the literature what we should do. But generally, we recommend that if the patient is symptom-free, to leave it alone and proceed to IVF. Surgery could be advantageous if the patient has failed multiple IVF cycles. It could be advantageous if the patient has pain, so you can relieve pain. Uh, and then possibly get the benefit from, uh, from proceeding to assisted reproductive technology. The ESHRI consensus, effectiveness of surgical excision of deep nodules before treatment of ART in women with endometriosis and fertility is not well established. So let's just look a little bit more in detail uh, at the uh, genital urinary endometriosis. This is bladder endometriosis infiltrating the bladder. Um, looking at five-year follow-up after partial cystectomy, excellent outcomes, one fistula. This is the ureter. This is, an, this is deeply fibrotic endometriosis involving the ureter. As you see over here, in order to excise this, you have to start laterally, and sometimes you have to uh, take the uterine artery, as you see over here, going into the endometriotic lesion, and this is the ureter. Best to take the blood supply before you start dissecting this area so that you know very well you have a dry field when you're uh, dissecting the ureter. As you see over here, the ureter is dilated. This is the right ureter as it goes into this uh, stenotic area, which has fibrosis. It is important not just simply to cut and re-implant. The, the disease must be removed. If you do like to proceed to um, uh, excision of endometriosis, re-implantation can be performed, but you must remove of the uh, local disease. Uh, the, our urologist colleagues feel that robotic-assisted ureteronasystotomy is advantageous. However, a very skilled, a minimally invasive surgeon without the robot can accomplish the same task. 
bowel endometriosis, as you see over here, obliterated cul-de-sac with the rectum being fused with the back of the cervix. This is the sigmoid area with an endometriotic plaque. This requires resection because of the uh, anatomy of the sigmoid. And, of course, resection is also um, encountered when lesion is large, 3 centimeters. Multifocal, this is the terminal ilium, uh, endometriosis of the, of the cecum, endometriosis of the appendix. So when do you do segmental resection? When there's deep invasion, large nodules, multiple nodules. However, you can consider disc excision if the lesion is no longer than, uh, larger than 3 centimeters, unifocal, and does not involve more than half the circumference of the bowel. This is what excision of a uh, disc excision of endometriosis appears like. This is the, um, um, the proctoscope, and here we've this, um, excised the disease. We just simply close it in layers. You see the ureters on the sides and the closed um, rectum. We test for, uh, uh, for any leaks and then move on. This is an example of a segmental resection. We stapled across the rectum. The hysterectomy has been done. Both ureters, the levators are clearly seen. And then we uh, bring out the proximal portion, put the, um, the anvil. As you see from the tubing, it's a very small incision. We put it back in, staple it. Now, segmental resection is uh, very effective. However, uh, there are potentials for complications, as you see listed in here, including stenosis uh, of the rectum and potential leak, which could be catastrophic. There are new symptoms, uh, secondary to radical resection. This is our observation um, of um, uh, significant improvement uh, um, and uh, it's, it's a significant improvement in well-being that we saw after we resected the endometriosis, and this was recently published in GMAG. But what we found is the segmental resection may be associated with higher incidence of new bowel symptoms, um, possibly related to pain, incomplete bowel movements, false alarms, but uh, not worth seeing constipation. Um, but we did see improvement in their, uh, in their pelvic pain. If a patient presents to you with stage 4 endometriosis, stage 3 or 4, and she is not, uh, uh, she is pain free, um, then it is more advantageous to proceed to IVF rather than to recurrent surgery, repetitive surgery. So in this uh, slide, this is a study we published not 20 years ago, where we looked at pregnancy rates in patients with, uh, that had previous surgery for endometriosis looked at IVF outcomes, two cycles, versus surgery. And we, although we did have pregnancies in the first nine months after surgery, about 25%, IVF was far superior. Post-operative adhesions, um, we, we recommend, if, uh, under perfect circumstances, perhaps using uh, regenerated cellulose, uh, but, it, but we do not recommend uh, the uh, acotodextrin. This is just a few examples of failure of medical management in postmenopausal women. In theory, this should not occur because the patient is hypoestrogenic. Nonetheless, uh, um, endometriosis can express its own aromatase, converting androgens into estrogens. As you see over here, you have this in this particular example, published in Fertility and Serialty, there was recurrence of disease in spite of using aromatase inhibitors. This is another example of recurrence or, of, of disease in post-hysterectomy BSO hypogonadic woman with a large uh, retroperitoneal mass which was under CT guidance biopsied and shown to be endometriosis. Uh, so in spite of a hypogonadal state, there are a subset of patients that in fact um, do have uh, endometriosis and therefore this must be managed surgically as they really don't respond to much. Tip, especially if they have a high burden of disease. This is an example of uh, catamenial sciatica in patients with endometriosis. On the right side you see piriformis muscle, the sciatic nerve. On the left side it's obscured and a CT by the biopsy showed endometriosis. This requires surgical removal. 
Finally, there's diaphragmatic endometriosis, which is actually quite common. If you are going to excise this endometriosis, you must be prepared uh, to uh, uh, um, incidentally enter the pleural space because the diaphragm is quite thin at this area. So these lesions could be ablated, perhaps. But if you do excise, uh, you will get into the pleural space and therefore require suturing. This is the left side with an implant. So this concludes part one of the uh, surgical uh, uh, approach to disease with endometriosis uh, with a, a variety of possibilities for management of patients with the different phenotypes. Now we're going to move on to the surgical management of fibroids. At the conclusion of this presentation, the participants should be able to identify candidates for robotic myomectomy, how to control and manage blood loss should it occur, plan apportment, uh, port placement for, and uh, surgical technique, and we're going to briefly discuss the tissue extraction techniques. Now, what are the steps to a successful outcome? First, successful outcome is the indication. Indication of surgery is critical. The surgical approach could be laparotomy, laparoscopy, or robotics. Then there are different steps. Dissection of the fibroid with hopefully not entering the individual cavity. Minimizing blood loss. Blood loss is, uh, is uh, one of the main complications of fibroid surgery. Appropriate closure of the myometrium. And then finally, the uh, extraction of tissue. So what are the refuted reasons for doing a myomectomy? Well, um, uterine, just because the uterus is big, that's no indication for surgery. Cannot palpate the adenexa. The patient is asymptomatic now but may develop symptoms later on. Is not an indication for surgery. Or that surgery will be difficult if the uterus is bigger, better to do it right now while it's small. These are refuted and, and should not be indications for surgery. The other uh, concept is the possibility of lios, uh, lyomyosarcoma. Well, the sarcoma is really not related to the size or rate of growth in premenopausal women. It's really mostly related to the age of the patient. Most sarcomas occur in older women, although they can occur in younger women. Menopausal status is a very important risk factor for sarcoma. A growing fibroid in a menopausal woman is always suspect and should be treated as cancer um, until proven otherwise. Uterine size or rapid growth have both been shown, not been shown to be predictive. There are certain risk factors, patients with antimoxifen, previous pil uh, pelvic radiation, certain hereditary types of cancers are increased risk of uterine malignancy. So let's go on to the potential fertility indications for removing a fibroid. Um, it is obvious that if a patient has a menstrual disorder, these patients should be treated. However, it is less clear when it comes to treating patients with poor uh, fertility or pregnancy outcome. In this uh, study in human reproduction, cavity distorting fibroids, and they resected them, the early losses were not different, but the mid-trimester losses improved. With non-cavity distorting fibroids, whether you operated and removed the fibroid um, or in, in this particular case, you perform no surgery. You just left the fibroids alone, and you looked at patients with unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss. So non-cavity distorting fibroids, unoperated, unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss, the live birth rate is the same. So again, not attesting to the fact that they are more similar to unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss. There are a few concepts um, that, that most uh, infertility doctors will agree. The uniquely subsorosal fibroids have no impact on fertility and should be left alone. The cavity distorting intramural myomas, cavity distorting, fertility improves with surgery. The main debate is the non cavity distorting intramural fibroid. Its effect on fertility is unclear. So if you have an intramural fibroid, its effect on fertility is unclear. Growth of myomas during pregnancy, significant number have no change. Equal number increase as decrease in size. Most of the growth is in the first trimester. Mean increase is about 12%. Um, and most will regress in the postpartum period. 
This shows uh, the odds ratio of poor pregnancy outcomes with fibroids versus no fibroids. As you see, most of these unadjusted uh, odds ratios are less than two, although they, they may be statistically significant. In fact, uh, with less than two, um, especially closer to one, it's difficult to really understand if it's more than background noise. Abruptio seems to be significantly increased, but if you look at it from the perspective of absolute uh, prevalence, it's 3% with fibroids are there and 0.9% if it's not. So how do we minimize blood loss? Well, the first question is, where do you put your incision? And the debate has always been horizontal versus vertical. Um, do you cut through vessels, as you see over here, the vessels that run parallel? However, we know that the neovascularization around the fibroid is, is uh, chaotic, and therefore, no matter what incision you make, horizontal or vertical, you will, uh, you will have some blood loss. So where do you put, why would you uh, bleed? Well, an improper plane of dissection until you get to the actual uh, pseudocapsule. And furthermore, it's been my observation that if you um, tunnel a lot, so you're trying to remove 10 fibroids through one incision, in fact, when it comes to suturing that area, uh, you may uh, experience difficulties in closing the defect through one incision. Uh, Furthermore, with robotic or minimally invasive surgeries, usually you have to close the incision before moving on because they are actively bleeding. Preoperative use of GnRH agonists have not been shown to a um, clinically uh, relevant decrease in blood loss at surgery. And um, use of bupivacaine, oxytocin, all of these have shown to have no clinical difference whether you use them or not on blood loss. However, uh, occluding the uterine arteries will decrease blood loss. You can do this by laparoscopy using these laparoscopic bulldog clamps, as you see over here. You have to dissect the uterine arteries and place it on them. Or this is an open procedure showing uh, the technique that we use, that we uh, dissect out, uh, lean down the bladder, open the broad ligament, and put a tourniquet around the lower uh, segment, as you see over here, occluding the uterine arteries. We also use Satinsky clamps, which are vascular clamps that clamp the ovarian vessels. And again, together, will decrease blood flow to the uterus, so therefore you can, uh, make, uh, you can proceed with surgery relatively bloodlessly. The use of mesoprostol has been shown to decrease blood loss. Uh, it has, uh, in this particular study, um, it showed uh, versus placebo, 400 micrograms one hour before the procedure, uh, less blood loss, no real effect on blood transfusion. However, a recent um, three years ago study out of abdominal myomectomies, randomized trials, showed a significant decrease in blood loss as well um, as you see hemoglobin drop with the use of rectal mesoprostol, 400 micrograms 30 minutes before surgery with the use of intraoperative vasopressin. In my uh, patients, I ask them to place 400 micrograms on the way to the, uh, to the, to to the operating room uh, that is uh, from home. And uh, at times, if it's not dissolved, it can be placed transrectally in the operating room while you're doing the, van the prep. IV tranexamic acid is also shown to decrease blood loss, as well as the use of the jombin, uh, gelatin thrombin matrix. Uh, vasopressin has been shown to be effective in decreasing the blood loss. Uh, the concentration should be quite dilute so that you can use a bigger volume. Uh, use of vasopressin is an off-label use, and, and it can have uh, side effects, uh, especially um, uh, such as antidiuretic hormone type of effects, as well as severe vasoconstriction. So useful, but well, used with caution. Um, the other uh, concept is to use harmonic energy. This is an example of using harmonic energy to make the incision. It was favored over electrosurgery plus epinephrine in a randomized clinical trial. Uh, the use of barbed suture uh, is also important. 
uh, is suturing time was decreased, the degree of suture difficulty was reduced, and there's a trend towards decreasing blood loss, but for those who have used these barb sutures, they're very effective. So this is the use of barb suture. Um, there are different types of barb suture, unidirectional. As you see, there's bleeding from the myometrium. Uh, however, with the use of the barb suture, we are quite effective in decreasing blood loss uh, and uh, achieving hemostasis. The barbs eliminates to a, a surgeon to tie knots and apply constant tension. Um, it is especially useful for those that are less experienced in laparoscopic suturing. So for example, over here, you put the stitch in, you pull, it, it, the, the tension is held. So in comparison to classical continuous suturing with knots, the use of barb suture decreases the time required to suture, decreases intraoperative blood loss. So what about robotics? There are no randomized clinical trials, but um, let me show you. So in this video, we're going to show how we um, can do this by conventional laparoscopy. Now, when you're doing this by conventional laparoscopy, as you see in this video, you need to have uh, the proper port placement in, in order to suture properly um, from either side of the patient, either the right or the left. So you look at typical port placement, as you see over here, and the, and the needle is angled. You can actually close the defects with a horizontal incision um, any way you want. You can do it from the right side. As you see, it goes in perfectly from uh, either left side or right side if you have a horizontal incision. For this reason, it is recommended for conventional laparoscopy that the incision be made horizontally so that you can bring in the suture, as you see in this video, from the left or the right, and you suture towards yourself. But because of the angle of the ports, you can easily bring in the suture, drive it in, um, and you will be perpendicular to the uh, incision. However, if the incision is made vertically, as you see in this uh, animation, it is very difficult to load the needle properly. And you would have to make it enter through a suprapubic port, which is uh, difficult to suture with, or you'd have to rotate either the incision or the needle, which is very difficult to do as you see it to rotate the needle. So in patients then with conventional laparoscopy, we recommend horizontal ports. In patients where um, someone is not as skilled with suturing, uh, then we recommend robotic surgery. If you are going to do robotic surgery, just remember there's no tactile feedback, so accurate myoma mapping is important either by very, very uh, detailed ultrasound or uh, magnetic resonance. If you are going to do robotic surgery, the robotic port must be placed 8 to 10 centimeters um, uh, from the tip of the endoscope to the top of the uterus. In other words, you, mind, you typically put the, the port above the umbilicus. Should we use a third arm? So as for those who are robotic surgeons, those is a third arm it's usually not cost-effective. Um, so therefore, we, I do not recommend using the third arm. Um, however, it could be in your particular hands that it could be cost-effective. The next challenge is where do you put the accessory port? As you see over here, the camera, which is placed in the umbilicus, and then we have three ports. The assistant port is placed up here according to the manufacturer. I do not recommend placing the port either uh, assist, uh, the, the large assistant port, either in the right or the left upper quadrant. Now, I just want to make the difference. This is the assistant port to, to introduce sutures. There's also different types of assistant ports, which we'll get to in a minute. So in my practice, I've eliminated one of these uh, robotic ports to decrease cost, move this up a little bit so the one and two ports are higher up. So this is the way I place it. So you have the robotic port here, robotic port here, and a robotic port over here. So these are the three port technique. Now the accessory port according to the manufacturer was to put it in the left or right little quadrant. And there is an ergonomic advantage to having an upper port to grasp the myoma. The problem is when introducing suture, 
when you introduce suture this way, it is difficult to torque the laparoscope sometimes to see the entry and exit of suture. And it has occurred where the needle has been evolved, and therefore you spend your time looking for needles. So the first modification that I uh, implemented was, again, I kept the two robotic ports and moved the large accessory port to the right lower quadrant where I could clearly identify the needles coming in and coming out. Um, however, I've now subsequently moved this port to the suprapubic area because we no longer use, it in our practice, an electromechanical Morse layer. I have also added a, a 5 millimeter, very small port here for the introduction of a 5 millimeter tenaculum. Now, there are some skilled robotic surgeons that use simply these two ports. Some people use even single port myomectomy. So this is the way it looks like uh, with this new approach. Um, I use the, the third robotic arm rather than number two so that we have a lot of space. We have over here the robot uh, uh, arm holding the laparoscope and I have made a suprapubic incision. As you see, the advantage of the suprapubic incision is that it's very small. I drop needles and, exp and, and remove them under direct vision. So the port, the, the, and the other modification is we side dock. Now this shows side dock with two ports, two robotic arms docked on the left and one on the right. This is what it would look like, two on the left and one on the right with the middle one <clears throat> being for, to hold the, the laparoscope. However, I've removed the number two, and now I have only three, and as you see over here, there's a lot of room. So the, the assistant can sit comfortably with the side docking uh, and can manipulate. Furthermore, I always recommend the patient to be in lithotomy position, even if you're doing this by open method, uh, because of the fact that you have the advantage of doing hysteroscopy and assuring yourself that the uterine cavity is intact. Again, the side docking with minimal ports lots of room for uh, assistance. The main um, dilemma or, or challenge in uh, robotic myomectomy or even non-robotic myomectomy is to excise the myoma with clear identification of where the uterine cavity is. You see here you have a thick myometrium, the distended endometrial cavity where we injected uh, dilute methylene blue dye. It is important to identify the uterine cavity. This is an open procedure. It is very important. It, there's, if you open the, the uterine cavity, it's not a big deal. As long as you, you identify it, make sure that it's separately closed without suture in the cavity from the myometrium. So as you see here, it was separately closed. The myometrium now will be closed. It is important not to put the, those sutures into the cavity. It is also important to, to note that the um, um, that when we uh, introduce contrast, this is a hysterosalpingogram, that in fact the contrast can get into the veins without even opening a vein. So sometimes when we inject, inject methylene blue trans cervically into the urine cavity, you may see some blue dye and you say, well, uh, you know, did I get into the cavity? In fact, it's just in, being introduced into the veins. So this is uh, an example of a complete resection using, um, this is, happens to be a robotic one. We're going to dissect the myoma. And what's important is to clearly identify the uterine cavity by injecting dilute a contrast transcervically so that you will know uh, that you're near the uterine cavity either by leak of contrast, but more importantly, by seeing a distended um, more, advan uh, more advantageously seeing it distend the cavity. So as you see over here, this is the cavity, distended. So in other words, no leak. And then we proceed to uh, close the defect as quickly as possible. So the main worry during this section is missing entry into the cavity. And if you do get into the cavity uh, without knowing, you, you can uh, have intracavitary adhesions. Right, so what do we do? How do we get this out now? In the, in the era of electromechanical uh, morselation, we used to replace one of the ports with an electromechanical morselator. Uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, we have we do not use no longer use the electromechanical morselator, uh, but we do we do use um, 
uh, ex vivo handheld uh, scalpel morselation. So this is an example of a big fibroid. We use this particular retrieval device because it goes through a 15 millimeter uh, trocar, which we place suprapubically. And as you see here, uh, this is the way that we would uh, put it in a bag and then morselate it. So this is the myoma. We will now grasp it and, pl and place it into, a, into one of these tissue extraction bags. Uh, this is relatively straightforward. You see the, the uh, uterus has been firmly closed. The suprapubic port, which I had showed you before that we now use for put, placing needles. Now we're going to use it to place the, um, the bag. And as you see over here, we're going to place it directly in the bag. It does taste, take some uh, manipulation, but it can be achieved. And then it's pulled through the suprapubic port, and then we use um, what would be considered an ex vivo morselation, as you'll see in a minute, as we uh, as we pull it through the uh, this particular device is a gel point. So once the bag has been delivered, we're going to uh, cut the top off, and then we're going to open the bag and use a scalpel to morselate it. There are different techniques for morselating fibroids outside of these, uh, these bags which can be found in the literature but essentially grasp and take a knife and if, you're, uh, if you want to challenge yourself that day try to morselate the entire fibroid uh, in one long strip which is somewhat of a, an academic uh, type of uh, challenge that our uh, residents like to give themselves and then it's complete. Postoperatively we recommend at least three months delay before attempting pregnancy. MRI data shows that it takes about that much for it to heal even just one fibroid. But there are no data to support the use of routine C-sections. So to conclude this portion, robotic surgery may have some advantage over conventional surgery. Uh, however, if, if someone tells me uh, that they're outstanding with conventional laparoscopy, I think that's the way to go. Just make sure you use a horizontal incision. Uh, there is a learning curve. Robotic times are longer. There may be uh, costs associated with this tissue extraction. We do not use an electromechanical mor um, mechanical morselator because this is, has a high profile in the country and, uh, <clears throat> and therefore more of a political problem. So then to uh, conclude, I have covered endometriosis and fibroids, which by far is the most common type of uh, situations that we will encounter in reproductive surgery. And of course, I would uh, um, invite anyone to send in their questions uh, for me to elaborate or to um, expand on any of these topics. And again, I'd like to thank the SRM for inviting me to give this presentation. Thank you very much, and have a nice day.